Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. The following program is a production of Chilling Entertainment and the creative team at Chilling Tales for Dark Nights and a proud member of the Simply Scary Podcast Network. Visit simplyscarypodcast.com to learn more about this and our other weekly storytelling programs and become a patron today to show your support and get instant access to our extensive archive of downloadable ad-free tales of terror. Thank you for listening and enjoy the show. Disclaimer. Horror Hill is a horror anthology podcast bringing you scary stories from all corners of the internet and beyond. As such, certain stories include content that some listeners might find offensive. Listener discretion is advised. Good evening, listeners, and welcome back to Horror Hill. As always, I am your loyal host, Eric Peabody. Now, I need to warn you in advance about tonight's tale. When you hear the title, you might think that we've gone soft, that we've started bringing more family-friendly fare to this table. But I assure you, this is no story of athletically inclined canines, partner cops sharing a laugh in the face of danger, or friendly little aliens that befriend local children. I don't want you jumping to any conclusions here, even though tonight's feature, written by Lucretia Vastea, is titled, Buddy. No, this story isn't lighthearted, though it does open with a surprisingly philanthropistic premise. The eponymous Buddy is Dr. Buddy Cherrywood, and he absolutely seems to have his heart in the right place. At the cutting edge, if you'll pardon the pun, of both neuroscience and biology, Dr. Cherrywood has perfected a procedure that can help his patients in a way that no other doctor can. And with a stunning 100% success rate, the amount of good that he can do for humanity appears to be boundless. However, as is usually the case, Buddy isn't everything that he appears to be. Or perhaps it would be more accurate to say that he is everything that he appears to be, but with just a bit more. You're listening to the standard edition of this program. If you'd like to show your support and enjoy ad-free versions of this and hundreds of tales from our audio archives dating back to 2012, Visit ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com and click Patrons in the upper menu to sign up today and get instant access. Did I mention they're ad-free? Thank you for your support. (laughs) 
And now, from author Lucretia Vastea, I give you Buddy. Buddy entered the lab at precisely 5.45 a.m. Five feet from the entrance, his coffee machine had just finished pouring its first serving of the day. Buddy's favorite mug was a heat-sensitive display of the world map. Buddy grabbed the cup on his way to the ventilators. They took at least three minutes and thirty seconds to start up, four minutes on chilly days, so Buddy turned them on first. They would have needed six minutes to fire up if Buddy had switched on the OT light and compressor beforehand, but he would wait. His first patient was a child, and children had the bad habit of freaking themselves out by scrutinizing the systems around the Chase Lounge. In their defense, calling that reclinable death trap a lounge was like calling a shard of glass a crystal. It was still a better term than dental chair. Nobody liked dentist appointments, so the last thing Buddy needed was to create more apprehension amongst patients by having them sit in a chair that resonated with pain and suffering. By the time they'd have to lay on the thing, they'd be too terrified to go anywhere near it and Buddy would have to reschedule them, which would result in postponing the session for three months or more. Buddy was a busy man, especially today. Today was a very special day. His first patient was Max Thorne, aged 10. Ruth Gillian, the psychologist, briefed Buddy in advance on the severity of his traumatic event. The doctor had to proceed cautiously, which could be tricky since Max hadn't spoken a word for the past few months. By the time his computer powered on to full capacity, Buddy had already downed half of his coffee, enveloping most of Europe and the upper halves of Asia and North America in darkness. The lab, on the other hand, was brighter than the hottest of summer days. The scanner was sensitive to movement, so it didn't require any manual activation. However, the cabinets in which the tools were stored and the software that Buddy needed were locked behind a thumbprint. Buddy provided that print on the small glass plate between his two 52-inch monitors and then walked to the wall adorned with his acknowledgments. Ms. Darling, the janitor, dusted the frames and wiped the glass clean on every diploma every other week. Buddy had told her repeatedly that she didn't have to do that, but the lovely lady had insisted. He should be proud of those, she said, and he should be. After today, he might even consider taking that advice. The screen adjacent to the main door broadcast the reception area, and Buddy was sure to throw it a look to ensure his morning was unraveling according to plan. 5.59 Sheila, bless her heart, had Max and his mother wait before sending them his way. Buddy needed his day to run like clockwork, and it had to start with his first appointment. 6 a.m., not a minute sooner or later. Buddy stopped in front of his PhDs in both neuroscience and biology. He used his thumbs to detach the bottom of the frame from the wall and placed his fingers beneath it to catch the pieces of paper hiding behind. Buddy still couldn't believe his fortune. He knew the contents of the legal documents by heart, but he needed to hold them in his hands, look at them, feel them, to remind himself that no... It was not a dream. No, the sleepless nights had not been in vain, and yes, the day had finally come. The day that he would fulfill his promise to his special person. The rider and amendment were back in their hiding place by the time the speaker beneath the CCTV monitor sprung to life. Buddy, Mrs. Thorne is here. Sheila kept her finger on the button, waiting for his approval. 6 a.m. on the dot. Perfection. Send them in. Mrs. Thorne had a firm grip on her son's shoulder. Buddy had never seen a parent accompany one of his patients into the lab without touching them in one way or another. Some parents held their child's hands. 
Others, like Max's mother, held them by the shoulder. Some would have their hand resting on the child's neck to either run their thumb beneath the hairline in calming reassurance or to prevent them from running away. The children were either glued to the parent or would try to shake them off ferociously. Max was of the former type. He clung to his mother like an empty battery to a power outlet. Dr. Cherrywood, call me Buddy. Mrs. Thorne opened her mouth to try the name on for size, but changed her mind quickly. Buddy bent to be at eye level with Max. Max sealed himself to his mother even more, eyes cast downward with fierce conviction. Hi, Max. Dr. Jillian told me a lot about you. How are you this morning? He couldn't sleep very well, but he's all right. It was a common occurrence amongst the parents who entered Buddy's lab to assign themselves spokesmanship for their child. It seemed to come naturally to them, like a means to compensate for not being there when their baby had gotten hurt. Max's suffering had rewired him to see everybody as a threat. In some cases, even the parents fell victim to this antagonistic lens, and maybe coddling her son was Mrs. Thorne's way of showing Max how grateful she was not to be pushed away. On top of that, the boy hadn't spoken a word in months, so the chances of him replying were close to none anyway. That was all right. Max didn't have to talk to get help. Not in Buddy's lab couldn't sleep well, huh? I'm sorry about that. I thought it would be best to do this in the morning, get it over with as soon as possible. Buddy straightened his back and resumed talking to the mother. I heard what you told my colleague about her therapy methods. A flash of shame brushed over Mrs. Thorne's face, but defiance replaced it quickly. My son ran out of Dr. Jillian's office three times in two weeks, one time crying his head off. You'll forgive me for doubting her methods. Buddy raised his hands. Oh, you are forgiven, and then some, Mrs. Thorne. I have a lot of respect for Ruth's profession, but we don't see eye to eye on many things. Max then dared to get a glimpse of Buddy. Especially trauma. Buddy turned and gestured to be followed. The mother and son did so while looking around, taking in all the high-tech gadgets filling up the space. Buddy switched on the OT light over the chase lounge, and as the fluorescent tube heated up, he also started the compressor. The patient and his mother were startled. Buddy couldn't blame them. The compressor conveyed the air of a switchboard used by phone operators in the 50s, but instead of having rows upon rows of empty jacks, it had rows upon rows of cables coming out of it. Most of them were plugged into different parts of the chaise lounge, but some stuck to the OT lights column. The whole thing looked like a technical collaboration between a Tetris master and the knitting club. Not to mention the lounge was another controversial story in itself. Mrs. Thorne, can you bring Max over here, please? Max dug his fingers into his mother's thigh and she looked unsure of how to proceed. Buddy smiled and gestured towards the lounge. What? Mrs. Thorne shook her head in search of the proper grammar. Uh, enlighten me, please. What is it you do, exactly? Buddy was not surprised by the question, but it did make him wonder why some people would sign a document without reading it first. I thought my colleague informed you of the nature of my practice. Not really. I just received a prescription and an appointment. And a consent form and an NDA. The mother blushed, but more than anything, she was annoyed. I'd still like a few more details, please. Buddy paced around the lounge. It's a new form of therapy, ma'am. A lot different than the one provided by the likes of Dr. Jillian. Very time-saving and fruitful, but quite drastic. Let's say it picks up where traditional therapy lets off. It's difficult to explain. Please try. Explaining this would be like narrating computer code. 
I'll tell you everything you need to know once we start Max's session. Dr. Cherrywood? Buddy. Her eyebrow twitched. Buddy, I know I signed the darn documents without understanding much, but I need some answers. And you'll receive them as we proceed. I'm on a very tight schedule, Mrs. Thorne, so if you don't mind... I do mind! Her voice bounced off the walls like that of so many parents before her. This is my child we're talking about! Max shifted his worried eyes from his mom to Buddy and back again. Buddy wasn't phased. Sessions with children were the most difficult, which is why he always booked them first thing in the morning. They were running late, but he would be lying if he said he hadn't seen that coming. I envy you, Mrs. Thorne. Mrs. Thorne was taken aback. Max felt her shift her body weight from one leg to the other. It's a wonderful thing being a parent. Children are amazing. So much potential to teach and learn from. To love and be loved in return. I don't... Buddy gulped. I don't have any children, I'm afraid. But that's all right. I decided long ago that I don't need any children of my own to help somebody else's grow. And I want to help yours, ma'am. He needs it. He deserves it. Mrs. Thorne closed her eyes and inhaled until her shoulders trembled. You don't know what my son's been through. That's where you're wrong. I do know. Mrs. Thorne let out a strained laugh. <sighs> yeah, I get it. Doctor patient confidentiality, my ass. You and the psychologist are a two for one deal. I don't know what she told you. No, Mrs. Thorne. Buddy's smile didn't reach his eyes. Nobody had to tell me anything. I can see it on him. I've had patients like him many times before. Max's eyes grew wide. Mrs. Thorne shook her head, and Buddy saw it as his cue to turn to his setup and explain a few things, hoping that she'd warm up to it. It's a ten-minute session, sometimes twelve, but that's rare. Max will have to lie down on the lounge, just like he did in Dr. Jillian's office. There's just one slight difference. See the headrest? Mrs. Thorne nodded. I'm going to have to put a special brace on his neck to prevent him from moving his head during the process. Buddy then looked around Mrs. Thorne to talk to Max. It won't be too tight, I promise. I want you to be as comfortable as possible. Max didn't meet his eyes, but he was listening, intently. Once the brace is on, I'll put a metal headband on his head. It'll be a little cold to the touch, but other than that, Max won't feel it at all. Once the band is in place, I'll fully scan Max's brain, and once I find the issue... Mrs. Thorne held her breath. I'll delete it. Max let go of his mother. Mrs. Thorne was too baffled to notice. Delete it? Yes. As in, you'll scan my son's head like a computer file? Something of that sort, yes. And you'll delete that memory like it's malware or a virus or something? Buddy cringed internally, but tried his best not to let it show. Of course, it's a little more complicated than that. You see, our brains... You want to reboot my son like you would a laptop. Mrs. Thorne let out an incredulous laugh. They all did at some point. First came the annoyance, then the disbelief. The disbelief was the trickier part. They would then either leave the laboratory forever, or... What else are you going to do to him? Hmm? Install the latest operating system? Max Thorn 2.0, the new and improved version. As I said before, Mrs. Thorn, it's difficult to explain. I'll have to show you. No, you're not showing us anything. I've heard enough. My son has been through a world of suffering, and I'm up to here with your... Tiny feet clad in rubber-soled sneakers smacked against the immaculate tiles on their way to the chaise lounge. Max jumped up on the plush leather and laid on his back. Once his head was cradled in the headrest, 
The boy stilled his gaze, fixated on the light above, waiting for Buddy to proceed with the session. Mrs. Thorne was dumbfounded. Max, honey, we don't know what this machine is capable of. Max didn't react. Mrs. Thorne let out a whimper and brought a trembling hand to her mouth to prevent more distress from coming out. Buddy waited for her to make a decision. He was running on a tight schedule, but he also understood that his work's novelty and outrageous nature overwhelmed most people. This procedure... The mother's breath glitched. What are the side effects? What's the worst thing that could happen to my son? She asked good questions. It was a downhill battle going forward. Let's say I scan his brain and don't find the trauma. Meaning your son will stay the same way he is now. How many patients have you had so far? 74. Your son is my 75th. What age range? So far, I've had patients as young as 4 and as old as 81. However, I'm not dismissive of people outside of this age bracket. What is your success rate? Buddy blew a raspberry and looked at the ceiling, pretending to make some calculations in his head. Technically, 100%, but six patients required two or three sessions, so... The doctor shrugged. For accuracy's sake, let's say 92%. Mrs. Thorne let out a shaky breath. The wheels within her mind were turning rapidly. If we do this, will it be like it never happened? Will he... Her entire body quivered. She gave her nose a quick swipe with the sleeve of her shirt. Will he forget what his uncle did to him? Eureka. Battle one. Mrs. Thorne, did you have friends or family involved in the 9-11 tragedy? Mrs. Thorne frowned. No. And yet, you agree that it was a terrible event, correct? Of course, it was awful. Precisely. And that's your objective view. Now, imagine how you would have felt about it if someone you loved would have been in one of the towers that day. Mrs. Thorne ground her teeth. Buddy continued. Your son is in one of the towers, Mrs. Thorne. He's in one of the towers during 9-11. Nobody can get him out of there. It's happening. He knows it's happening, and he'll relive that nightmare daily for the rest of his life. Today, however, you get to decide if you'd rather have him watch the tragedy on TV from the comfort of your couch or let him stay in the tower forever. The mother was rocking back and forth, unsure of what to do. Buddy walked to his computer and touched the piece of glass between his monitors in a pattern that only he knew. His fingerprints and pattern allowed Buddy access to his lifelong work, which was the compressor's software. Mrs. Thorne, can you join me, please? Mrs. Thorne positioned herself to Buddy's right and stared at the big monitors, trying to make sense of the amalgam of shortcuts on the desktop. He counted on her to do so. The further she was from Max, the less she saw, which was best for parents, especially mothers with no scientific knowledge. Memories are stored in the hippocampus. Buddy clicked on the symbol of a funnel, a pop-up asked for a password, which Buddy provided with his left hand while his right one touched three other shortcuts on the adjacent monitor. And the emotions attached to those memories are stored in the amygdala. The password-protected system opened to reveal something similar to photo manipulation software. Buddy issued three more clicks, and as he did so, the OT light hovering over Max closed in on the headrest. One more click had Max's face, in full HD, appear on the screen. Max tensed up, and subsequently so did his mother. I can't do anything about the hippocampus, I'm afraid. The memory is there to stay. However, the emotional baggage that comes with it is a different story. Mrs. Thorne didn't move. Mrs. Thorne, signed agreement or not... 
I won't proceed with the session if you don't want me to. Do it. The mother was crying silently. She looked afraid, but determined. Buddy sympathized. Are you sure? Yes. Do it. Mrs. Thorne closed her eyes and tried to keep as quiet as possible as the tears rolled down her face. All right. I need you to stay here for a second while I put the equipment on Max. Then we can start. Mrs. Thorne did as she was told. Her son's face reassured her that he was okay, and if something were to go wrong, his change in expression would let her know. From a practical standpoint, although nifty, the camera installed in the OT light was useless to the session, per se. Buddy only relied on it when his patients brought company. Keeping the company glued to his computer meant he could do his job without explaining basic biology or having to diffuse a mental breakdown. Buddy leaned towards his patient. Hang in there, all right? The boy kept quiet. Buddy grabbed the metal headband from under the chaise lounge and raised Max's head with his free hand to click it in place. Does that feel okay? The thumbs up would have been easy to miss, but Max was otherwise so still, his answer couldn't have been clearer. Buddy liked him. The neck brace was attached to the compressor by a cable, or so it seemed. Neither Max nor his mother knew that the neck brace and the metal headband were a cover-up for the actual device that got the job done. A latch was built into the headrest, under the back of Max's neck. The cable coming out of the compressor ended in a receptacle with two needles, half an inch long and thin as hair. They were thin enough to avoid poking any blood vessels, which was a good way to dodge burdensome explanations. Buddy took the receptacle out of the pocket inside the neck brace and lowered it under the lounge with practiced discretion. The doctor couldn't see what he was doing, but he didn't need to. At the computer, Mrs. Thorne was watching Buddy arrange the brace on Max's neck, whereas Buddy was, in fact, inserting two needles in the back of the boy's head. Max showed no signs of discomfort. Perfect. Try to keep still. It'll be over before you know it. Mrs. Thorne was so invested in reading her son's face that she barely noticed Buddy's return. Buddy closed the camera and pressed a button that said, Scan. No sooner had he done that, the OT light got three times brighter and issued the sound of restless bees. There, on the screen, where Max's face had been seconds prior, appeared the outline of his head. Everything else was unrecognizable, to his mother at least. Colorful spots within colorful spheres occupied the space within the boy's skull. Ah, there we go. Buddy showed Mrs. Thorne a purplish spot on the screen. The amygdala is loaded with negative emotion. He then zoomed in on the purple spot and uncovered an epidemic of chromatic patterns. Here, here, and here. The map of Max's head looked intricate and complex, but Buddy wore the face of a student who had studied thoroughly and was confident in the subject matter. Max, we're about to start. It'll be over in five minutes or less. Buddy selected different spots within the amygdala. He then opened one of the drawers under his desk and retrieved an oblong, silver-colored object. What is that? Mrs. Thorne had dropped some of her initial reticence, but her questions were still loaded with doubt and alertness. This, Mrs. Thorne, is a plain, run-of-the-mill USB stick. Buddy uncapped the object to reveal a USB flash drive indeed. The doctor then proceeded to insert the said flash drive into his computer, and after highlighting his selection within Max's brain, he opened a feature entitled Actions and clicked on Extract. Max's mother was astounded. The window that opened next asked Buddy to pick a destination for what was to be extracted. Buddy chose the USB drive and pressed Start. After he did so, a rectangular pop-up asked him and his guest to wait until the extraction was complete. This is incredible. 
Max's mother looked both afraid and fascinated. I can't believe you're downloading my son's trauma. Well, I wouldn't call it downloading because that wouldn't remove it. But we want it gone, don't we? Buddy smiled at the woman, but she was too mesmerized to catch it. Max's mother was as tense as a guitar string, stretched to its absolute limit. Your son is going to be fine, Mrs. Thorne. Better than fine. He's going to grow up a healthy and happy young man, I promise. Max's mother sighed, and the extraction was complete before Buddy could reassure her anew. Mrs. Thorne wanted to rush to her son's side first thing, but Buddy asked her rather imperatively to stay put as he removed the equipment. Once the receptacle was out of the boy's head and back in its rightful pocket in the neck brace, Buddy looked at Max and was surprised to find him awake and alert. Most patients fell asleep during the extraction, especially after suffering a trauma that rendered them sleepless for nights. Max, is everything all right? Max's mother was at their side in a matter of seconds. Honey, are you okay? Max blinked once, then twice. What time is it? Buddy was the first to react. It's 623. Max blinked again. I have soccer at 10. Mrs. Thorne let out a strangled sob and brought both hands to her mouth. Max reached an arm out to her. Mom, can we go home? I'm hungry and don't want to play on an empty stomach. Hunger was the second most common effect of the extraction. Buddy couldn't suppress his smile. He was just about to let Mrs. Thorne know of this, but she spoke instead. Soccer? He hasn't played in months. He didn't want to go. The woman turned to Buddy and looked at him with what could only be described as adoration. I don't know how to thank you. Buddy was surprised to see Mrs. Thorne do a 180 so quickly. She sat down on the lounge and hugged her son tightly. Despite an annoyed, Mom, stop, you're embarrassing me, the boy returned his mother's embrace. A lot of parents were still skeptical of Buddy's medical practice, even after the session was over and a total success. They would question if scanning their child's brain was thorough enough because their trauma couldn't possibly occupy just 312 megabytes on the USB flash drive. Or how could Buddy know which emotional baggage was of the bad sort and which of the good sort? What if Buddy extracted good emotions instead and turned their children into sociopaths? What if Buddy didn't diminish the bad emotion, but enhanced it? All of these questions were exhausting and time-consuming, time which Buddy didn't have. Also, what parents and patients alike wanted to know most of the time was what would happen to the USB flash drive. If Mrs. Thorne was going to pose that question, Buddy would tell her, like he told everybody, that the USB drive was to be destroyed in a specialized, third-party facility by a hired professional who respected the integrity of all those involved. If pestered further, he would point out that the flash drive, alongside its contents, was now facility property, as so stated in the signed NDA, in one of the many paragraphs that no one could decipher. The doctor gave the patient and his mother a little privacy. Back at his computer, Buddy clicked on Safely Remove Hardware and wrote Max, 10, Sexual Abuse on a piece of adhesive paper before attaching it to the storage equipment. He then opened the drawer in his document organizer, which he kept under lock and key, and let the USB drive fall inside. Once the mother and child were ready to leave, Max lunged and hugged Buddy. The doctor was happy to return the hug, and, to his surprise, Max's mother joined in on it. The woman then apologized profusely for overstepping her boundaries, but judging by her happy, cried-out face, she wasn't sorry at all. The flash drive containing her son's horror was already forgotten. Buddy knew that Max and Mrs. Thorne would be okay, as would his next patient, scheduled for 6.30 a.m., Jean Kim, 
aged 46, PTSD from his time served in the military. After that, at 7 a.m., Eugenia Bagall Smith, aged 31, she had witnessed her cousin being run over by a truck. The list of appointments went on until 9 p.m., when his final appointment of the day was due. Working from 6 in the morning until past 9 in the evening was overtime overkill, to say the least. If anybody had asked, it was for science. Except, it wasn't. Not today. Every cell in Buddy's body was dancing. The legal documents were still hiding behind his PhD on the wall, but Buddy was more aware of their presence than he was of the clothes on his back. Yes, today was going to be a very special day indeed. Buddy was fidgeting. His last appointment was at 7 p.m., and that had been a bad idea, because the time that he had thought would be useful until his appointment at 9 turned out to be stress-inducing and nauseating. Buddy lost count of the number of times he stood up only to sit down again. He rearranged the already well-organized contents of his numerous shelves and drawers, and even did a portion of Ms. Darling's work, vacuuming the entire lab. There were questions upon questions bouncing off the walls inside his head, and the only way to silence them was to go over to his PhD on the wall and check to see if the government-issued documents were still there and still allowed him to do what he was about to do. They were. And they did. Buddy held them in his hands and took several deep breaths. Save for himself and the security guards, the facility was empty. Buddy had made sure of that. When he had finally received approval to perform a session on this person, having the facility to himself was a non-negotiable item. Now, however, Buddy wanted to share the moment with somebody. Diana, his ex-wife, for example. After all... Both of them had waited 16 years for this. The live CCTV footage by the entrance showed two individuals entering the reception area. The larger one of them asked the other to take a seat. One quick look at the man sitting down had Buddy launch towards the button that would stream his voice to the visitors. It was 10 to 9, and Buddy was about to invite a patient into his lab earlier than appointed for the first time in his career. Gentlemen! The two men flinched. My laboratory is at the far end of the second hall on the right. The taller individual took the lead, and the other one rose to follow. Officer Jones! The taller man froze, and then walked towards the speaker he heard Buddy's voice come from. Yes. I'm afraid I'll have to ask you to wait in the lobby. The tall man frowned. But... Mr. Gunn received my email, did he not? Yes, but sir... Buddy. Buddy. This is a private therapy session, and my conditions were clear. I will only see Mr. Blade. The shorter man chuckled, and despite being given a look of caution by his companion... It didn't deter his amusement. Buddy's heart was beating so hard it felt like it wanted to open his chest. I will also ask you to remove his handcuffs. Sir, Buddy, Buddy, this is not your ordinary patient. I know. This man, I am aware. Don't worry, I assure you I have means to protect myself. Buddy had no such thing. Now, as I stated in my email, I will see Mr. Blade alone, without the handcuffs. On cue, the shorter man spun with his hands in the air. Officer Jones was baffled. Dr. Buddy, with all due respect, no handcuffs. I will only see Mr. Blade without the handcuffs, or the session is off. Do I make myself clear? Buddy took his shaking finger off the button and did the short breathing technique that calmed him down. The officer looked unsettled. Buddy pressed the button again. Officer Jones, 
Any day now? The patient laughed cheerfully as the officer underwent an internal debate. Buddy was shaking from head to toe, dreading that he had made a terrible mistake, but the guard's resolve fell in his favor. The taller man grabbed Buddy's next patient by the collar and produced a key while dropping warnings and pointing at the gun on his belt numerous times. The cuffs came off. Mr. Blade was too giddy to care. It was a matter of mere seconds until Mr. Blade would set foot in his lab, and Buddy needed everything to go perfectly. The doctor took control of his breathing and looked around, ensuring that everything was exactly where it should be. Usually, his laboratory was so bright that people had to squint to see properly. Not this time, though. Buddy had turned the main lights off. The confinements of his practiced profession were completely dark, save for the computer screen and, of course, the OT light above the chaise lounge. Buddy tapped his right coat pocket to ensure the remote was still there. The automatic doors parted, revealing a dark silhouette with bright eyes in the lab's entryway. Knock, knock. Buddy's nervous system was burning like rocket fuel. Who's there? Atch. Atch who? Gesundheit. Mr. Blade knocked his head back and let out a roll of laughter as natural as saccharin. Buddy joined him. They laughed for what felt like hours. Buddy, you're my kind of buddy. Mr. Blade came into the half-sphere of light coming from above the chair he would be laying on. You have the funny bone. I beg your pardon? The funny bone. I'm a comic entertainer. I recognize people with a funny bone straight away. He meant comedian, but the doctor pretended to be less smart than that. A comic entertainer? As in, an actor? Mr. Blade whistled. I don't know. Are mimes actors? I believe they are, yes. Well, in that case... Mr. Blade took one step back, hoisted his chin up, pointed the tips of his feet in opposite directions, and rotated both arms slowly until his knuckles stopped on his hips. I am not an actor. Buddy knew better than to let the awkward silence spread. He waited two seconds before laughing and bending to slap a knee for emphasis. All right, Mr. Blade, you got me. Difficult to recognize without the red nose, aren't I? He snickered. Buddy gave him the most welcoming look he could muster and shrank the distance between the two of them. The closer he got to Mr. Blade, the more he liked what he saw. Mr. Blade was cheerful, genuinely so. Despite the low visibility, his smile was sincere and his face was glowing. Best of all, something was shining with the sun's power within his eyes. That something was hope. Do you know why you're here today, Mr. Blade? I'm here for the therapy. Why, yes. Yes, you are. Why are the lights off? For ambiance. Also, I don't want the bright lights to interfere with your circadian rhythm. The patient hummed in approval. Circusadian rhythm. Buddy smiled. Follow me, please. Mr. Blade spun on his axis and began skipping in his pursuit of Buddy. Once they reached the lounge, the patient let out a distinct whistle. Look at that fancy therapy chair! That's right. For me? All for you. Oh, ma, if you could see me now. Sean Blade in the fancy therapy chair, doing fancy therapy in the fancy therapy room. Buddy laughed again. Mr. Blade sprinted towards the chaise lounge and hopped on it a couple of times, like a child on a new mattress. Buddy tried to not let the irritation show on his face. And careful, we don't want to break the fancy therapy chair, now do we? No, Sean's a good boy. Yes, Sean is a good boy. 
Sean is the best boy. That's right. And Sean will lay down now with his arms at his sides and relax. Mr. Blade's smile faltered. He looked at Buddy anew, scanning him from ear to ear like an intricate painting. You don't think Sean's a good boy, do you, Buddy? Not a question. Buddy felt his collar tighten. What makes you say that? Mr. Blade looked down at his lap. Sean was not always a good boy. Oh, I don't believe that. No! The patient was now sitting on the lounge with his left knee propped up beside him and his other leg swinging front to back. Sean did things. Buddy frowned. Throughout the years, he had practiced different expressions in the mirror to make himself look more approachable to his sensitive patients. Puzzlement, understanding, compassion, and, the most difficult one of all, indifference. For the time being, puzzlement seemed adequate. What kind of things? Bad things. A drop of warm sweat rolled down Buddy's neck and into his undershirt. That's all right, Sean. Everybody does bad things sometimes. Mr. Blade's face split into a smile as sharp as a scythe. Even you? Buddy shrugged. Sometimes, I guess. The patient chortled. You can't be that bad. You got the funny bone. A flash of red rolled over Buddy's vision. So, people who have the funny bone are good people. The best people? What about the people without it? I don't like those people. Why not? Laughter is life. People with no funny bone have no soul. Buddy started pacing around to keep the blood flowing in his limbs. But how can you know? You look for it. The soul? Mr. Blade snorted. No, silly. The funny bone. In an instant, the childlike excitement drained out of him. Mr. Blade stopped moving his leg, and his face contorted into the one he wore in the papers, next to the updates of his doings. Didn't they tell you what I did? Buddy said nothing. Didn't they tell you about the bad things Sean has done? Buddy tried implementing the breathing technique in a way that his patient wouldn't notice. I like laughter. Some people like chocolate, but I like laughter. Some people like alcohol and cigarettes, but I like laughter. Some people like sex, drugs, and rock and roll. I like laughter. I like making people laugh. It's what I do. It's what I need. For a brief second, Buddy wanted to check the security monitor to ensure Jones was still in the lobby. Some of them didn't laugh, so I practiced some more. I practiced and practiced. I came up with more jokes, balloon animals, magic tricks. But some kids just... Mr. Blade shrugged. I had to know. I had to know why they weren't laughing. He sighed and looked lost in his inner world for a moment. Do you know why some people don't laugh, buddy? The doctor took a shot in the dark. Because they don't have the funny bone? Bingo! Because not everybody has the funny bone! The legs started dangling again. I know they don't. I looked for it really well each time. Real good. But it was never there. Do you know what that means, buddy? The doctor waited. It means it wasn't me. It was them. I can make everybody laugh. If they have the funny bone. Tell me, Sean, this funny bone... Where is it exactly? You're the doctor and you're asking me? A doctor who doesn't know about the funny bone. Ha! 
Mr. Blade raised his right arm and slapped the area connecting his elbow to his triceps. It's right there, Mr. Blade grimaced. Most of the time. Buddy was puzzled. Most of the time? You know, you never know with a funny bone. He's a joker. Sometimes he's in an arm, other times in a leg, the sternum, the head. You don't know where he'll pop up to say boo. Mr. Blade let out a shrill laugh. Buddy fought hard against incoming nausea. But you never found it? Never. And I looked everywhere. Ribs, skull, spine, teeth, everywhere. Children with no souls. The lot of them. And they said I was the bad one. Buddy switched his demeanor to indifference. Like I said before, Sean, everybody does bad things sometimes. Mr. Blade directed a melancholic smile at the floor tiles. The swinging of his legs slowed down. I didn't think they would let me see you. The doctor was confused. I just found out this morning. My hearing didn't go as my lawyer said it would. The jury didn't think I was sick. They wanted me to get the needle. But now I'm not getting the needle anymore. I think... The patient's eyes widened, and his head snapped towards Buddy so fast that the doctor thought he'd break a tendon. Am I going under the needle now? Buddy laughed and raised both hands to dismiss the idea. My goodness, of course not, Sean. That's not why you're here. Buddy was itching to finally tell somebody about the legal documents hiding behind his respectable diploma. It was both depressing and perfect that the first person he would tell was Sean Blade himself. As of this week, the lethal injection is illegal in this state. The patient gasped loudly. You're joking. I'm not, no. Are you sure? Absolutely positively sure? Yes. Do you promise? Mr. Blade's face had regained some of the hopeful glow from earlier. Buddy liked that look on him. A lot. I swear. The patient exhaled like half of his body was made of carbon dioxide. I'll live. Forever in a cell, but I'll live. Oh no, Sean. You're not going back to prison. Mr. Blade almost fell off the lounge. I'm not? No. Your condition is very special, and you'll receive the proper treatment for it. I can promise you, you'll never see the inside of a prison cell ever again. The shock on Mr. Blade's face was the stuff of comic books. Are... are you serious? I am. But... but how? The jury said I'm guilty. Buddy hoped his gulp wasn't visible. They changed their minds. Sean Blade looked like he was about to launch to the ceiling and beyond. However, Buddy proceeded with caution. You'll have to work with me. We have to start the session now. That did it. Mr. Blade suddenly laid down on the lounge, and no sooner had he put his arms at his sides that Buddy pressed the button on the remote in his coat pocket. The patient yelped. Sean Blade's arms, legs, waist, and head were encased in thick steel rings that kept his body cemented on the lounge. Uh, what, what is this? Buddy didn't answer. He turned his back on the patient and returned to his computer. Although useless for the procedure itself, Buddy turned on the camera in the OT light. He wanted to see Sean Blade's glowing face and watch every glimmer of hope bleed out of it. The patient laughed. You don't have to do this, buddy. Get Jones in here if you're scared I might do something. He has a gun. He'll keep you safe. Buddy opened the software. The OT light began to buzz. Mr. Blade felt it then, the cold steel rings keeping him motionless alongside the surrounding darkness. 
get Jones in here. I'm serious. I'm a good boy. I'll be a good boy. You can trust me. He can put the cuffs back on. You should have been a good boy before, Sean. You should have been a good boy 26 times before. The systems were up and running. As the inside of Mr. Blade's scalp was being scanned, Buddy returned to the surface his patient lay on. Sean Blade was trying to twist and turn in hopes that the steel rings would relent. By the time that Buddy knelt to remove the latch, Mr. Blade was panting from the effort. What is all this? What are you doing? Buddy didn't respond. Answer me, damn it! What are you doing? The doctor didn't bother with the neck brace this time. He retrieved the cable with the two sharp needles at the end of the receptacle and stood up straight. Sean Blade froze. Buddy pretended to study the needles right over his patient's head to ensure that he caught the bright light reflecting off of them. What is that? Despite reducing movement to close to nothing, the metal restraints couldn't prevent the patient from shaking. No. No, no, no. You said... You said the needle's illegal now. It's illegal now. Get that thing away from me. Buddy inserted the needles in the back of Blade's neck. As always, the patient felt nothing, but his scream suggested otherwise. Let me out of here, you son of a bitch! You let me out of here right now! I'm going to sue you! I'll sue you! Jones! Jones, get your ass in here! Officer Jones couldn't hear him, but he would have given the CCTV camera the middle finger if he could have. Jones! Do you hear me? You useless piece of shit! Get in here! Buddy unlocked the drawer where he kept the used USB sticks. He pulled it out of its framework and dumped all 75 labeled flash drives on his desk. Buddy! You'll lose your lab, buddy! My buddy! You'll lose your lab, your career, your life! Everything! I'll sue you so hard! We'll share a cell, buddy. Buddy. Tell me, Sean. Mr. Blade's brain lit up on the computer screen. Buddy ignored the bright colors. He simply selected the whole amygdala, opened an actions feature, and clicked insert. Do you remember Annie Blossom? The patient stilled. He seemed to be turning pages of experience in his head, looking for the reason why that name sounded familiar. And then, it hit him like a sack of bricks. Buddy looked over the flash drives, deciding on which one to start with. Max, 10, sexual abuse. Jean, 46, military PTSD. Barbara, 31, domestic violence. I... she... Sean Blade's eyes swelled with tears. He struggled for words, but the incoming sobs wouldn't let him speak. Let me guess, you couldn't find her, Funny Bone? The patient might have freed his arms if the metal rings had been of lesser quality. You... you said... you said the needle... Oh... I never lied to you about that, Sean. Sean Blade's tears and mucus dampened the metal and leather surrounding his head. Another sob rippled through the darkness of the lab. Please, please, buddy. Buddy chuckled. (laughs) That's not my name, Sean. Neither is Cherrywood. I didn't mean it. I didn't... Oh, I think you did. Sean Blade was crying bitterly whilst struggling for words. And I can assure you, you were wrong. My daughter had the most beautiful laugh in the whole world. Buddy chose a flash drive. Whose it was didn't matter. By the end of the night, every horror file on his desk would be stored in Mr. Blade's amygdala forever. The needle! You said the needle's illegal! You said... Don't worry about that, Sean. I meant it. The lethal injection has been outlawed for good. However... 
Buddy inserted the flash drive into a USB port, selected its contents, and hovered with the cursor of his mouse above. Start. By the time I'm done with you, you'll prefer death a hundred times over. You've been listening to Buddy by Lucretia Vastea. Lucretia Vastea is an author and artist based out of Germany, whose written works have been adapted to audio by the likes of the Chilling Tales for Dark Nights podcast, the No Sleep podcast, and Otis Geary's Scary Stories Told in the Dark. Well, my friends, that concludes our evening. I hope that those of you with dental or medical phobias weren't too adversely affected by tonight's tale. I know that I tend to get a little jittery myself when I'm in the dentist's chair, but at least I've never had a needle surreptitiously slid into my spine. Well, at least I haven't, in so far as I can tell. Be sure to come back next week at the same day and time for more scary stories to keep that chill of excitement running through your blood. As always, if you need more frightening fables in the meantime, be sure to check out the Chilling Tales for Dark Nights YouTube channel or podcast. Until next week, listeners, stay spooky. If you enjoyed what you've heard on today's program, please take a moment to stop by our iTunes page or wherever else you listen to your favorite podcasts and leave us a five-star review and a kind word. It makes a huge difference and would mean a lot to me. If you'd like to hear a premium, ad-free edition of tonight's and all of our other episodes, visit ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com and click the Patrons link in the menu at the top of the screen where you can become a patron for as little as $5 per month and get access to our entire audio archive dating back to 2012, including past episodes of this program, all of our other shows, and hundreds of standalone releases, all of them ad-free and available to download or stream. Thanks so much for your time and for giving our sponsors a try today. When you support our sponsors, you help support this show, and that means a lot to me. If you happen to use Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or YouTube, you can follow and subscribe to Chilling Tales for Dark Nights there, where you'll get all of our latest updates and new releases, and have the chance to interact with us each and every week. As for me personally, you can find me on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube, username Viking Guitar, and also on Instagram as Viking Guitar Productions. In particular, if you're looking for someone to provide voice work for your own project, or are in need of audio production of any sort, it would be wonderful to chat. Until next week, listener, when we meet up once again atop the horror hill for yet another dance with darkness, I bid you good night. Sleep tight, listener, and if you hear scratching at your door, don't open it. The darkness may have found you, but it's up to you to let it in. You've been listening to the Horror Hill Podcast, a production of Chilling Entertainment and the creative team at Chilling Tales for Dark Nights and a proud member of the Simply Scary Podcast Network. Visit simplyscarypodcast.com today to learn more about our network and our other amazing storytelling programs. Tonight's episode was hosted by, and its featured tale performed by, yours truly, Eric Peabody. Selected stories have been adapted with the kind permission of their respective authors. Original music provided by Nikki McSorley and Eric Peabody. Finalization by Craig Groshek and S.K. Brown. 
Got a terrifying tale of your own that you'd like performed? I take submissions. Email it to us today at submissions at simplyscarypodcast.com to have your work considered for future production. If you enjoyed what you heard on tonight's program and are joining us on your favorite podcast app, please subscribe to us to make sure you never miss an episode and leave us a five-star review and a kind word. Your feedback means a lot to me. You can also follow Chilling Tales for Dark Nights and yours truly on social media to connect any time and get the latest updates on this and our other programs. If you're listening on the Chilling Tales for Dark Nights YouTube channel, do us a favor and hit the subscribe button and the bell notification icon as well to get more spooky tales from me and the crew and another episode of this program each and every week. And don't forget to hit the thumbs up button to let us know how we're doing and leave us a kind comment. Lastly, don't forget to visit us at ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com and consider supporting the team by becoming a patron. In addition to helping us out, you'll get exclusive access to our audio archives and ad-free downloads of all of your favorite stories, including those you've heard on this program. As for me, you can hear more of my work on the Chilling Tales for Dark Nights podcast. However, I will be back next week with more terrifying tales to keep you up all night. If darkness is what you're after, listener, your search is over. Yet, let it be known, you haven't found the darkness. The darkness has found you. Chilling Tales for Dark Nights.